Welcome back to World War II TV. The biggest question in the sidebar seems to be, what is the myth? What are we discussing today? Well, it's a complex one, this one, because it, there is a myth and yet there isn't a myth. There are complete myths and there are constructed ones that we need to examine and explain. And explain. To look at the French resistance, we turn to my better half, Magli de Ken, who's two rooms away in the same house as me. What are the origin of France's resistance stories? I'll bring her in now. Good evening, Mag. Uh, I know. Hello, I know Paul. Hello. It's the funniest meeting like this. So we're going to go straight into this and talk about it. So we've we've titled this video um, a, a certain way. Um, let's explain to viewers what the hell does that word mean. So that word, resistentialism, is a, a neologism that was created in 1987 by a French historian, Henri Rousseau. Uh, it designates the myth developed above above uh, all by Gaullists and communists, uh, that the French have unanimously and naturally resisted since the start of the Second War. So that's, uh, that's what it means, uh, resistentialism. Um, and um, it's considered as, as a myth um, as well. Um, so um, it really all starts with de Gaulle's speech um, in Paris, uh, the very famous speech, uh, the day of the liberation of Paris, so that's August the 25th, uh, 1944. So you have that speech just um, over there uh, where, well, uh, the General de Gaulle, um, you know, um, just... Um, 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 he basically doesn't. He doesn't thank any. He doesn't thank the Allies. He doesn't mention everybody yes, else. He, he just says France is liberated. French. Uh, yeah. Paris was liberated by the French, um, and um, he doesn't mention or really at the very end uh, the Allies. So this is really the foundation uh, of the myth. And um, to be to be clear, uh, it is also something that was used. Um, as a political statement and a political strategy intention, um, because uh, the priority after the war, um, and de Gaulle was uh, part of that uh, first uh, temporary government, is to unify uh, a divided population, um, to bring back on its feet um, a country that is absolutely devastated. So um, that... Uh, that idea that uh, France, the French, the population, uh, was uh, resisting uh, the um, enemy, uh, resisting Vichy, was absolutely necessary um, at the time. And it's going to keep going on uh, for the next 30 years at least, because it's only in the mid-70s, and it's going to actually come from uh, an American historian uh, whose name is Robert Paxton, and um, he's the one who's going to um, probably um, give a second um, appreciation, a very needed appreciation, uh, rewriting, re re uh, reading uh, of the history. But before we go into your uh, resistance and analysis of it, we need to go back in time a little bit to a generation before, because I think there'll be people watching this who aren't aware of some of this. And this is the legacy of what's been happening to France as a country in the previous generation. So um, birth rates and population. So we've got these um, these graphs you put together. So so basically, Maggie, what happens to France in the First World War for anybody who doesn't know it? Well, it's a huge um, trauma, of course, and um, well, the, our demography is going to drop. We we've lost 1.4 million uh, soldiers uh, during the first war. So, of course, the consequences uh, on the demography, on the economy, uh, is real, uh, and that's also something to consider. 20 years later when uh, the second war starts. Uh, of course, not only France is concerned about it, but uh, this uh, program today is uh, about uh, the situation of France. Um, there's 1.4 million who, who die, but there's also 3.4 who, who were um, wounded. Uh, there's more than half a million widows, so definitely the demography, the next uh, decades, uh, will be affected uh, yeah. by it. The point we're uh, making, folks, is that 
birth rates plummeted in the kind of the First World War, but it, it, uh, it, it then rose again in the 1920s. But if you look at the graph on the right there, folks, you can see that at the beginning of the war in 1939, the Second World War, that is, the population was where it had been in the First World War. And in fact, since the beginning of the First World War to today, the France, France's population has not quite, but nearly doubled. So France was at a massive kind of manpower crisis at the early part of the war. So, uh, Thanks for that, Mag. Um, so this whole idea stems from the fact that how many people were in the resistance? Where were the young men of France in 1940? So we're going to go, well, Mag is going to take us through that now. So 1940, take us through what yes. happened. So it is to probably uh, understand why that myth uh, has been so important and in a way still still actual um we decided that we will be facing the the myth with uh, figures and some realities so uh 1940 june 1940 when um the defeat um happened uh the german are going to capture 1.8 million um frenchmen um servicemen so 1.8 million men and i always uh, make sure at the beginning of a tour that um, this is well understood because those men, who are they? Well, they are the ones between 20, 35 years old. They're going to be gone for the next five years. Uh, each single family in France has, of course, uh, a father, a brother, a cousin, someone. Uh, each single family has someone who's in Germany at the time. So that uh, will get will get give of course consequences uh, on uh, the next four years uh, and life um, in France. And now we're going to turn to the 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 STO, uh, and I'm sure there'll be people watching here who don't know what that is and how that affects everything. So explain that and explain what these posters are, are talking about. So um, 1942, um, the German uh, who are always in the need for more um, um, manpower uh, will kind of um, uh, set up a deal um, to bring, send back home one prisoner uh, against, uh, to trade him with three uh, workers, French uh, workers, um, specialized workers because of course germany uh needs uh you know the germany has so many men uh in the front that they need in germany you know all that manpower in the factories in the farms um to always produce more um so this is not really gonna gonna work uh even though there's nearly 100,000 prisoners who are gonna come back from that so a few months later um in February 1943, uh, then it will be decided, and of course, uh, this was with the cooperation, uh, collaboration of the Vichy government, uh, that this time it's going to be uh, mandatory for any young man who's, uh, who was born between 1920 and 1922. So this will really create a massive reaction in France. Um, even though 600,000 young French were sent to work to Germany, this will really be, uh, will give uh, to the French resistance like a second uh, boost. You know, the first boost being mm. 1940, the reaction of um, Germany invading France, then this one here will be a, a, another one. Um, a strong one because uh, part of the 200,000 young French who try to um, escape uh, this uh, forced labor, because that's forced labor, uh, definitely they don't want to go work for Germany. Uh, so 25% of them um, are going to join um, the Mackey. So uh, that's where we can really talk about a big booth and the Mackey will... Um, you know, really start uh, in that period, 1943, which is also uh, definitely a different situation, uh, and the population start to, um, uh, well, um, take distance uh, with Vichy and start to uh, react. Uh, also, well, as we know, you know, what's going on in the world, uh, North of Africa, 42, Italy, 43, Russia. So uh, Germany seems to, um, you know, 
not be the, the strongest country that it was a uh, few years earlier. Uh, so that's extremely important. And um, same thing when uh, so many families have uh, a member who's a prisoner, there's also lots of families who have um, people who had to go and work in Germany. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that middle poster there because the deal offered was was so unfair. Is that if if you to get a prisoner back to France, it was it three three people had to go and volunteer to work in Germany, or was it two? In forty two, in forty two, then uh, the um, um, STO in forty three, when it's mandatory uh, work, this time it's anyone born, any male, it's mostly yeah. male, born between nineteen twenty and twenty two. Um, they were told that it was a bit like a, a national service. Yeah. Uh, and um, that was their duty to go, and that was their part of it, um, to go and work in Germany. And it would be a shame not to, because, uh, you know, um, then um, you're, you're not making the return of uh, prisoners possible. You're, you know, you're not uh, keeping the good relationship with Germany going on. So that will really um, decide uh, that young population yeah. Um, to join um, the the resistance, uh, the Maki will start building up. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe a bit later about the the zone where those Maki's were possible. Yeah. Um, and well, they they are they are going to live in clandestinity. So uh, the resistance also will offer you know that uh, network and. Um, yeah. organization so uh well we have here a uh, interesting figures uh so the population in 1939 then on the right side um the percentage number of people in military service and the percentage regarding the uh, the um the, the the total population so um um well 10 percent for the uk uh 12 percent for the us and in france if you add all that up uh you reach um, you, know, you reach about six percent or so um as we said it explains where half of the young men are excepting the, the fact that there are already less young men there because of france's casualties in the first world war and as you said the the number of men who are working still in france trying to keep the crops coming that they're still working the trains they're still doing all the things there so what we're trying to do here folks is explain where the young men of france are uh, and 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 why they can't necessarily be in the resistance and now you know this is the maps there so so talk about the geography of i want to go where... back one second please to the, yes, the of figures. course Thank you, because uh, this is population in 39. And of course, uh, in on the right side, this is more like 1944. Uh, uh, and uh, we haven't mentioned them, but there's also the Free Friend Forces, 73,000, who are the, well, partly um, half of them, uh, who are the ones who left France to join uh, mostly England. Uh, and the others are um, coming from our colonies. Um, um, French colonies, the empire. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, yes, that's the uh, terrible map, the awful map with uh, the two zones between uh, 1940 and November 42. Uh, so occupation zone, all the north and all the Atlantic coast uh, and the free zone, the center and the south of France. Uh, and with the next map, uh, it will be clear uh, that the... The Maquis uh, will mostly be um, growing, um, established uh, in the south, uh, on the east. Uh, why? Well, um, because that's where you can find mountains, uh, woods, which is uh, a necessity. I mean, you need, uh, for to live in clandestinity, you need, um, uh, you, need uh, you know, that possibility to, to hide. Uh, there's still a large Mackie, uh, of course, in, um, in Brittany. Um, so this is in 1944, when the entire country is now occupied. So there's no more uh, demarcation line. Uh, but often on tour, I got asked about, you know, the resistance in Normandy. Of course, we had resistance. I mean, resistance 
uh, groups, uh, nets were all over France. Uh, in Normandy, though, or the northwest of France, which was the most occupied zone by the German, uh, this is where you have much more uh, sabotage, intelligence, uh, but not the way you picture uh, the Mackey with, uh, you know, sometimes a couple of hundreds, even more, of young men, uh, you know, training to fight, uh, who had the possibility to get some... Um, uh, some weapons, uh, all that organization, uh, this is possible where you can hide. Yeah. And also, well, the center of France uh, is not really strategic for the Germans, so there's less German uh, over there. Exactly. The irony being that the areas that are good for resistance units to train aren't necessarily the areas where they can do the most damage against the German occupiers. And as we, we were trying to get across to you folks is that people like my granddad, my great great uncle and many of your relatives watching, they became soldiers, sailors and airmen because they had time to be trained. They were taken away from their homes and they were built into soldiers over weeks and weeks and months and months. If your country is occupied, how can you do that? You can't just instantly learn how to fire a Sten gun. If, and to have a Sten gun, you've got to have an area to be dropped dropped to by the British or the, the Allies. So that's what we're trying to go there. But now I want to move you on, Mag, to this. You talked about Robert Paxson earlier and the definition of resistance. So when we're talking about resistance, how does he define it? So um, the way you define it, it's um, there's one word to describe it. It's an act. Uh, it's taking action. So um, the act itself, the intention behind it, and the hope for uh, the consequences of it. Um, Paxton also limits the number of resistors to the 400,000 men and women who are uh, were part of movement and networks. This is his definition, not just his definition. Uh, but, you know, the to, to be part of a, something organized uh, seems to be uh, the, um, the, the the formal account about it, to be the member of a group, of an organization. Uh, but, the, of course, there's loads of isolated acts of opposition. Um, so who are uh, those resistants? Well, they are, they are mostly... Uh, mostly young people, uh, they're men, women of all ages, uh, social background, who are who choose to uh, refuse to disobey and to resist uh, Nazi Germany, but also uh, Vichy government. Um, and um, what will make the difference between the um, the the ones we can really define as resistors uh, it's the action because of course yeah. by 1944 uh, there's a large part of the population who uh, uh, you know wants to disobey uh, could not stand having the german around them um, live in the stress uh, the the restriction the requisition the forced labor uh, but few are going to take action uh, which uh, represent, let's say, about two or three uh, percent. But it's, I believe, quite honorable because um, it's um, it's such a huge risk. Uh, there's so much uh, engaged. Um, Let, let's move. I want to move you on to this other idea: the concept of. So Paxton defines you have to be kind of part of an organized network or resistance movement to be to, to be classified as resistant. But this is the thing that is get where it gets complicated is that there are many French people and people in Denmark or Norway, or any other occupied country who may have just done one act during World War II. Maybe they they helped move a Jewish family uh, trying to evacuate through there. Maybe they helped an allied airman get to somewhere safe. Maybe they sheltered someone They or they just did the minimum of work they, they, they could for the Germans. The Germans who've turned up at their farm and said, you must produce hay for our horses. They just try and produce the minimum amount they can. This is, this is where we can't possibly understand how many people were actively against the occupation, can we, Mag? Well, there's so many ways uh, to resist um, as well. Um, and uh, the one we, that comes to mind is always about the, uh, the intelligence, like we said earlier, the sabotage or taking part of armed operation. Uh, but it's, I believe, clear that without the support um, of, well, quite a, 
well, at least a part of the population, that resistance would not have been possible as well. I mean, the Maki needs to be fed, uh, and um, there's um, lots of um, everyday people, regular people, normal people, I would say, uh, that will take part of that big chain. You know, if, it, if it's a small thing, like uh, uh, passing pictures of the Atlantic Wall, uh, passing envelope, passing uh, food, uh, you know, giving a, a, a bike uh, or something. Um, and of course, they're not taking the same risk, uh, but they're part of it anyway. And this is a it's different, difficult to quantify, you know, how how mm. big it was, but it's still important. Um, the myth, um, of course, is we can't believe that myth. And I, I grew up in France, I'm French, so uh, we, we used to say, oh, in 1944, we had 40 million uh, in the resistance. No. Um, but we did not have as well 40 million collaborators. Uh, the large majority of the population is just trying to to uh, to to leave uh it's just trying to put food on the table it's just trying to be to stay safe uh and uh, that uh, conflict is uh, uh they don't really know where it's going it's extremely difficult uh condition then in uh, in 1944 um well the uh, you know the um, when the preparation for the the D Day, you know, will start. Then in Normandy, in Brittany, you know, so many region, all the France are going to be under bombardments again. So life is extremely difficult, uh, and um, of course, uh, the large majority of the French cannot stand that situation. But what to do? Uh, it's not possible for everyone. Uh, to be engaged, uh, and I have no, absolutely no problem with that, yeah. um, because, um, you know, what will we do if we were in their shoes today? Um, but I really like uh, in Chris Millington's book, and he did a, a program on uh, World War II TV, uh, I like the, the two words he used to uh, define uh, the complexity of that period. It's defiance and accommodation. Um, and um, it's, for me, much better than uh, the binary uh, resistance and collaboration, yeah. because this is, um, this is not true as well. Well, that's it, exactly. I mean, th this is, when Mag and I have this conversation in our, in our living room, my granddad was in the army, my grandmother stayed at home, my great uncle was in the army, my great aunt was at home. It's easy to see those positions. One was serving the country, one wasn't. Within an occupied country, it it just doesn't feel fall that neatly. That's that's you obviously have some people out in the Verkor who are actively going out. They are almost like soldiers. They have officers, they have leaders, they have weapons, they're being dropped supplies, and they go out and they actively engage the Germans or in Brittany. Brittany folks almost liberates itself within. But most people within France, it's just hard to break it down. So you know, you, you're you're our French person here, Mac. With we don't get many French viewers. Where, where, where do you think we are with this myth? Are, have, has France finished coming to terms with its World War II, or is it still a process? Ooh, well, you got a minute. <laughs> I got a minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, <laughs> complicated, uh, and um, we're still um, well. The witnesses of that period are almost uh, gone. At least you know all the ones who were part of the Vichy government and all. But it's still. Uh, it's. I mean, there's not one week in France where this is not mentioned. Uh, it's still a huge. Um, it's still a big wound, an open wound yeah. uh, in France. Uh, we haven't had the time to talk about, of course, the deportation as well. The uh, and this is, you know. I mean, we are right there, right now, into those topics. You know, the uh, but seventy plus seventy thousand Jews were deported in France, uh, and you know, it was the the Vichy government who was part of that as well. So there's a there's a lot. So this is more like um, this is more than twenty minutes. But that myth, uh, probably in 1944, at the end of the war, 45, um, was a necessity to bring yeah. some uh, peace, uh, to avoid a civil war, 
um, and um, to rebuild uh, the country. That, so that's that was a priority for, uh, again, as I said earlier, for De Gaulle, but it's not just De Gaulle, it's also the communists. And they're going to, you know, use that for, you know, decades. Uh, and like any other country, you know, I think we are struggling with facing the darkest hours yeah. uh, of our history. And uh, we're still working on it. Well, we are, it. and well, th that's it. You know, it, it it's a work in progress, and and I, you know, the, the myth here is that it was it was a necessary myth. It, France had to heal itself. Denmark, Norway had to heal themselves. The myth about Roosevelt knowing about Pearl Harbor was a stupid myth that didn't need to be established in the first place. Just idiots came up with it in some ways. But this is a myth that is complicated. So, Mag, it's been fantastic talking to you. I will see you later on when we meet up after the third show. Folks, I will see you all back again in f half uh, five minutes' time with Michael Ackerman talking about the beats, the beast of Omaha, the butcher of Omaha. Um, it's been great. So thanks for your comments. Thank you for your patience. I'm not used to that exercise. You're brilliant, mate. Everyone says that you're fantastic. So there we are. Thanks for seeing in five minutes' time. This is Paul Woodhouse for World War II TV. Link, like, subscribe. Bye. Thanks, everyone.